the journey that we go on on design is never a linear path whatsoever. Business of Architecture, episode 377. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking to Kyle Webb, who is the founder and principal of Web Architects, who are based in Colorado. Now, Web Architects was born in 1999 and the firm boasts an impressive array of innovative designs. Many of them have got regional and national recognition uh, and a lot of the projects are in the town of Vale. Um, web architects have also worked outside, they've worked in New York, Florida, Michigan, Indiana uh, and Ohio and in this episode Kyle discusses how he moved from Pittsburgh and Cleveland to become based in Colorado and become one of the premier architecture firms in the state. Um, he talks a lot about working with high net worth individuals and also collaborating with other architects. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode with Kyle Webb. Today's episode is sponsored by Sweet Process. Are you frustrated with how long it takes to get stuff done in your architecture firm or with how chaotic or confusing things seem to get? Well, then let me tell you about a much better way of getting work done and let me tell you about an amazing tool that will help you overcome the frustrating log jams in your architecture firm. Sweet Process is a simple but powerful tool that lets you create clear step-by-step -step instructions for every task in your architecture firm, from onboarding new clients to training employees to responding to client requests. So everything gets done more easily and more reliably. Plus, you'll have a central place where everyone who works with you, your employees, contractors, and even virtual assistants can access your procedures anytime from any device. The best way to understand how Sweet Process streamlines your work is to start using it. The company offers a 14-day free trial, but as a loyal listener of this podcast, you can try for 28 days free of charge. You don't even have to enter a credit card to get started. Just navigate to www.sweetprocess.com forward slash BOA to start your free 28 day trial today. Kyle, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? I'm wonderful, Ryan. Thank you. Excellent to be speaking with you. Now, you are the founder of KH Web Architects. You founded the business in 1999. You've got an extraordinary portfolio of beautiful custom houses, predominantly in the Colorado region and surrounding uh, surrounding areas, often mm -hmm. to, to a, a very high level of detail and, you know, working with some quite extraordinary clients, I would imagine as well, to produce the type of work that you've, you've been working on. I understand that originally you're from Cleveland and yeah. Pittsburgh. East and Cleveland, yes, and, and back and forth in those areas where I grew up. Got it. And currently right now you're in Denver about to working on a synagogue project. I am. I'm, uh, I'm in Denver today for a meeting. Uh, we're designing a ritual bath for the Jewish community. And I have a renowned expert from uh, Minneapolis, a rabbi who is the ultimate designer of mikvahs, which are these baths. So fun day to day for me. Fantastic. I love it. So the, I suppose the first question is, is how or why did you start the business? What happened that kind of inspired you to, was that always the game plan? Yeah, it was never the game plan. <laughs> 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 and I think it's that way with many firms. Um I had been with a firm uh, for about eight years, and uh, I had had a partnership agreement on my desk for the, a year, and it hadn't gone anywhere. And I finally one day said, "You know, it's it's time. We got to figure this out." It was you know stressing me out, and I one of the partners and I had to had to meet. That you know I wasn't exactly sure, but the other partner said, "You two need to go meet." I went to have lunch with this guy. I sat down at a table and he said, you'll never be a partner as long as you're with the firm. I promptly got up, pushed the chair in and left. And I had no idea uh, what I was going to do. I had no work. I had nothing. And the next day I resigned. Um, mm. And uh, it was um, a holy <laughs> moment. <laughs> Wasn't sure where I was going, what I was going to do, but uh, uh, you know, it was it was a good tract. Uh, I was I had a four person office in about three months, and wow. uh, 
and uh, continued on uh, several of the projects I was working on with my old firm. But uh, it was really good. I, I was off and running right away. And it was a wonderful thing. How, how did you win those first projects? Well, you know, when you're, I guess I would say I was, you know, I wasn't a partner, but I was a, a one of the leads in the firm. Mm-hmm. And, and when I left so promptly, it was odd that um, people didn't understand. I, you know, I played the game and, uh, you know, was very upfront with people that I had chosen to leave. And um, within, you know, hours I had phone calls. This was, you know, back email was not a big deal yet. And uh, my phone was ringing and people were wondering, what are you doing? Why? No, we can't lose you. We, we, we need you. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I did have a consulting contract for about eight months with my old firm on several projects to transition out. But, um, you know, one of them immediately terminated my old firm um, and hired me. Another one, basically, when my uh, consulting contract was up, said, that's it, we need you. And uh, I continued on. And uh, uh, that was a project that went on for another five years in my office after that. So uh, I, I was very lucky for, to have that kind of start. And, well, well, um, it, it's interesting as well, because around that time, 99, and then obviously 2000, 2001, and then that was one of the first big recessions that your mm-hmm. business would have, would have survived. Uh, gone through. What was it like in that in that period, kind of, kind of around the two thousand and one recession, kind of after nine eleven and that that sort of period. What, you know what? what, uh, what I was, was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky. Um, you know, being based in a resort economy, um, I I really not felt any of the recessions, uh, in except the most recent one, of course, um, but. Those were just a blip. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the joke in our community is we're the last in first out if there is a recession. And even in, you know, 2008, 2009, um, I was really lucky. I never laid anybody off in my office. Uh, I was able to keep my entire team and uh, uh, keep it going. And I won't say we weren't adding elevators to buildings and trash enclosures and things like that during that time, but we were we made it, we've made it through. So I've been really lucky my entire career, really not to be too challenged by the economy. When you first started, you were saying that, you know, within a few months you had a kind of core team of four people. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the scale of the business right now in terms of personnel? So I've, I've grown very slowly. Um, My original vision was five and Mm -hmm. I said, I'll never be more than five. Yeah. (laughs) Um, among those original four, I actually have two of them still with me after we're wow. going to be 22 this year. Um, and, uh, you know, as, so as my team has grown and matured along with me, uh, I've grown a little bit along the way just because we can handle more. Mm-hmm. Because the vision's always been for me that I want to be involved in every project. And, uh, you know, based on on that scenario, that's been my challenge is just keeping keep been growing naturally. And then more recently, I think with technology changes, uh, you know, for example, we have somebody who just does digital renderings now and, and drafting. And uh, I brought in an interior architect and we're, we're kind of just evolving as these younger people have knowledge versus my older mature staff who, uh, you know, had had difficulties transitioning from AutoCAD to Revit, you know, mm. so it's, it's been a little bit of the technology adjustment. You've always kept the team around that size. Has that been, what have been some of the reasons for that? Well, again, I always tried to, you know, I wanted to be five. I felt that's what I could manage well in my mm-hmm. world of residential architecture. And then as, as the, the team has matured and, you know, I still have some of those original people, you know, they've been able to grow their ability to manage projects. So it's, it's made me kind of be able to keep my position, but also, I don't have to, you know, be breathing down their necks and over their sh- looking over their shoulders nonstop. I, I really have a great group, and because of that, I've been able to grow just and keep the same model as time has gone on. Got it. And I suppose at that scale, you, you're saying it, that allows you to still be very much involved in the the design process, or absolutely, absolutely. I I really try to 
you know, I, I, I don't design everything. I let my team, you know, we have fun trying to create great ideas and, and whoever has the most, you know, the, the greatest epiphany on every design, that's where we go. And it's not just, you know, me sitting there telling everybody what to do and what they must, what the design must be. I, I really like to make it a team effort. And um, like many firms, I like to, you know, bring other people on the team into the project for feedback and, and, and let everybody understand, you know, and throw their ideas at, at the project. Mm. And obviously in the, in the area that you're located in, how did you come to be in, in Vail? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, my, my parents had a, a condominium, a ski condominium in Vail when I was growing up. Right. And, uh, you know, I always joked I was going to live there. And, um, you know, when I got to looking at colleges and whatnot, I looked at the University of Colorado and my parents said, no way. Um, we're not going to assist you. You can't, you know, we're not, we're not going to help one bit. So I gave the application to see you to one of my best friends who ended up going there, He's still here. And, um, and I, I, uh, went to school at Catholic U in Washington, DC, but it was always that draw to come back here. I, I got my first or my second internship, uh, in Vail in, uh, in the eighties and worked for a firm. And I, uh, really, I got I was done. I said, I'm coming back here. And uh, that's, that started the path there. So I had three summer internships. Well, what, in was it, what was it that drew you to the, to the area? I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's a wonderful place. It's got kind of the attributes of a major city, mm -hmm. you know, with culture, um, you know, and again, on a small scale, but it's kind of the most big city, small town you, vision you can have being mm -hmm. in Vail. Um, you know, the architecture can be very cosmopolitan and, and, uh, and wonderful. And, but also the, you know, it's, it's a place where, you know, everybody, and uh, it's a really a small town. Mm. Um, so it really has a great quality being in a resort area. Um, I really, really enjoy it. The, the kind of work that you've been working on predominantly has been private residential. Is that correct to say that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's where I started and that's, that's what we always do. And, and, uh, our portfolio, you know, generally shows beautiful homes and I assure you, that's not all we do. You know, we design closets and kitchens and anything <laughs> residential in our, from our office point of view, they just don't get, make it to our website. So. Got it. But you, but you, you haven't moved out of that sector and, and done offices or, or even hotels or, or more kind of you know, the sort of commercial aspect of residential if you like where it moves into that into hotels and commercial we definitely property. have trickled into it um mm -hmm. there you know we are in a place where there's lots of condominium buildings and things like that so we we've definitely done um, a whole series of renovations of buildings uh you know common areas and exteriors and then associated with that you you know you'll renovate some of the condominiums within the within the buildings um, that's kind of an ongoing thing. We're always doing at least one of those projects. And then, uh, more recently, you know, it was, it was a partial, um, nonprofit project, but ski club Vale, which is, uh, the, the group that Michaela Schifrin and Lindsay Vaughn came out of, um, as skiers has a building that, you know, uh, prime piece of real estate at the bottom of Vale mountain, uh, it was uh, eight or nine years in the process, but we tore that building down and built a, a new brand new building for the club. And then uh, it had two penthouses on the roof. And uh, we're at that stage right now. We're finishing the, the last penthouse probably in the next 60 days mm -hmm. on that building. But the building's been up and running for two years. And, you know, that's that's a big building for us. And that was, you know, 25,000 square feet. So. How how do you or what what have been some of the things that you've learned over the last you know since 1999 um, of how to kind of keep your projects profitable? What makes an unprofitable project? What makes a profitable project? And and I ask that because that you know we look at some of the work on your portfolio and the the level of detail obviously is is extraordinary, and they're kind of these beautiful houses that many architects would just be like, oh my God, this, this would be the dream sort of project, but also delivering and winning those kinds of projects are not without their enormous challenges. Mm -hmm. So how have you, how do you keep them 
profitable? Um, I'm, I'm really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, I can't complain about how we do. Um, and, you know, the, the way I started out, I worked for a firm, the, pre, the previous firm I worked for, um, they probably did about 50-50 where they would do fixed fee or hourly projects. Mm-hmm. And I took the model of really trying to focus on doing projects hourly. Um, so what I do is I establish a budget with the client and then tick forward toward that number. Um, you know, residential projects can often go off the rails, um, you know, decide to redesign. We've built things and tore them down and, you know, you know, as odd as that is, but some of our clients make those decisions. So the journey that we go on on design is never a linear path whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so therefore if I can, I've, I've tried to maintain everything hourly and along that path, we talk about it and that way it stays profitable and keeps us moving, uh, do, do going you, forward. If, if you're doing, um, setting it as an hourly rate, how do you negotiate that upfront with the client? Do they ever have kind of caps that are put in place and expectations, which can't, which can't be exceeded or. Sure. Uh, I'm, I try to right on the front side, really establish a budget for the project with the client. Um, and you know, sometimes if you see our work, you know, sometimes we have pretty extraordinary budgets, but, um, you know, it's somebody gets into the tens of millions on a project, which we, we have many times now. Mm-hmm. Um, if I, if I put a, a, a percentage fee on that, I'd, I'd be retired by now. On some of these deals. <laughs> so, um, I think, I think, we, you know, our hourly rates are fairly high, uh, for a residential firm. I, I, I do know. And I think that's probably where our profitability lies that just in, in keeping rates at a higher level and then ticking forward in, in an hourly manner on a project. Got it. So, so yeah, put, putting a percentage fee is kind of not, not workable, but you prefer to do the hourly rates as opposed to a fixed lump sum. That's correct. And, and that, that works well for us. And, you know, we just finished, I'll I'll say it was a $30 million house took seven years. Um, I could have never foreseen where that was going. The journey it was on, uh, the owner would remodel, loved to remodel. Um, and the house, you know, again, six, I guess it was six years of construction and, you know, that's, that's the right. And that's what they hire us for. So yeah. it was a journey. It was fun. And I could have never in a million years saw where that was going in any, any world mm-hmm. of projecting a fee. It, it, the, the, the kind of projects that you're working on these, you know, $30 million house, or I think the one that where I first fell in love with your work, was it the castle Creek retreat? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's an ex- extraordinary building. Um, how do you get in contact with these types of clients and are they client, are they client led Are the actual owners buying and living it or some of them developer led types of projects? Um, you know, we're always doing development projects. Right. Um, I try to keep that limited to maybe one to two projects per year, our developer mm-hmm. projects. The rest are in general at this point, and, and it's been this way almost my entire career. People just hire us. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't compete very much for projects. Um, and again, in our very small community, you know, there's only two or three architects. We seem to all interview for the same jobs and people pick one of us. It's funny. Um, but, uh, more often than not, I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky that people just hire us for what we do, especially these days. And, you know, they, they like our work and they say you're hired and our reputation and, and referral network, um, you know, really reaffirms that. Do you actively market or are you, is it more to do with publications and publishing and that sort of way of finding work? You know, I, my previous employer, um, I, you know, admire him immensely. He always spent money advertising. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure it ever meant anything. It just was part of the image. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've kind of followed suit there that, I, I'm I'm pretty sure we don't get much work from advertising, but I I do it always uh, because it's part of getting our image out in the world and, mm-hmm. and letting people know our name and and um, 
it, I feel it's really, really important. So I, so I always monitor and, and try to take care of making sure that we're, we're in publications also. Um, and we're, we're very widely published on a regional basis. And that's always, you know, that's always a blessing to have free advertising. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I try to get us exposed as much as possible, but that's not where our work comes from by any right. means. And, and, and so most, most of the work is word of mouth referrals from happy clients. And is there a process that you have in place for, um, you know, kind of encouraging referrals? Do you actually actively have conversations about it at any point in your, you know, when you're kind of onboarding clients? Um, it, it, it's organic how it happens. I think it's nothing that I, you know, chase or pursue. Um, you know, we do have a tremendous amount of repeat business in our mm -hmm. office. Um, I kind of, you know, the, the pandemic really actually increased it. Um, we tried to calculate it here recently, and I think we're somewhere in the 60, 65% of our, our work is repeat clients right now. And, uh, you know, some people are just upgrading, upsizing, remodeling, whatever. But um, so if, if we can keep that going, that's our best source of business regardless, because these are all people we know well mm. and it can, it can be efficient and, you know, we really enjoy them, you know, also. How, how do you know when a project is not the right fit? <laughs> wow. Um, was it too late? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably an exact, the best way to approach it is, yeah, you, you know, it's too late when you get the, the wrong project. Um, I, I definitely try to weigh and measure mm -hmm. as best I can. I hate to say that. That's not the, the right words, but um, I really try to get to know people before we get started. Um, I try to vet them out, make sure that, you know, they're realistic and their numbers, you know, that they, uh the budget's appropriate for our locale and where we're working. And I think by the time I get through that process with the client of programming and, you know, before we really get started on design, we, you know, we know it's going to work and uh, uh, you know, not all, not all projects are perfect as, as we all know. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you, you know, get, get into it and it's not the right fit. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have more recently tried to, if we realize something's not a right fit, we try to actually end it fairly quickly. Right. Uh, and instead of suffering our way through it, which we, you know, we have all done before. Yeah. What, what for you as a, as a practice or a firm, what are the sorts of things that are red flags or alarm bells that kind of indicate this is, you know what, this is not the right fit for, this is not best serving us. This is not best serving the client. Um, we're in a place where construction costs are astronomical. Um, right. And I think that's probably the driving factor for us is, you know, people come in uh, to Vail and uh, other resort communities and expect, you know, they can build for the same as they would in, uh, you know, St. Louis, Missouri. And that's, that's not how it works uh, where we are. And uh, I think once I can vet through that process with them, I think that really determines if it's going to be viable, you know, from our end. Got it. And so do you have a lot of clients then that who are coming from out of state or they don't, they're not necessarily, they don't know the area as such, but they're investing in the area or they're relocating. You know, a lot of people, what I find is they'll, you know, they'll come into Vail and they'll buy a condo and they'll be there a while. And then eventually as their economic picture increases, they, you know, they'll say, I really want to build that house or, you know, and have that penthouse or whatever. And that's, that's, so generally most people are already in the community when we, mm -hmm. when we have gotten to know them and they've already heard of our reputation, but I do find that, you know, some of the people that, you know, when they're just dipping their toes, that's when I, you know, have to ed try to educate them. And I try to make that with every client, really educate them on the process and what they're going to go through and the duration and, and how the process will go. Mm. Well, what are some of the parts that you find working with, with clients? And obviously, you know, when you're working with residential clients, this is often the first time that they've, they've have built something. Mm -hmm. Um, well, again, may, maybe not. Um, where are the parts that you find that the most amount of education or the most important parts of the process for them to understand is? You know, for what we do, it's very touchy feely. So, you know, 
for example, yesterday I was, you know, in a, in a meeting with a cabinet designer with a client and, you know, we're talking about, you know, what side of the bed they sleep on and what's on their nightstand. And, you know, we get into minutia in our world, um, you know, where, where you keep your socks in your closet and, you know, I sometimes know way too much about my clients, but, (laughs) (laughs) uh, um, but because we're so kind of into the minutia and touchy feely with our clients, it really helps us get to know them and make the process, you know, where we're educating them on where we're going. So it's, it builds and builds and builds upon itself as we go forward. And I, again, always start on the front side with a real education process as much as I can before we even start drawing with right. everybody got it got it and in terms of being in veil and you know, i speak to um a number of practices who are kind of in in the sort of mountain regions of the of the us and one of the hardest problems that i often hear is you know finding talent um and actually finding new new staff and you know because some of the some of the you know you've got the the coasts on the us which are you know lots of metropolitan areas that are kind of bustling with architecture students has that ever been an issue for you or you, you know it's difficult to find talent or how have you managed to find the right team members um <laughs> it, it it's an enormous challenge where we, where we are mm-hmm. um the cost of living isolation um we're we're not in a major urban area. So what I've found over time is if, if I've recruited people from elsewhere, uh, many of them have been epic fails. Uh, right. They get, they arrive in Vail with this dream and they don't want to be there. Um, also, uh, you know, single employees who, you know, have no, nobody, no relationships. Vail's a horrible place. There's no professional community or very minimal, you know, to, you know for them to network within. So, it's, it's always been a tremendous challenge, um, the cost of living, um, whatnot. Um, so what I, what the, the funny thing is everybody in my office today, the group I have other than maybe one, maybe two, mm-hmm. uh, out of 10, uh, I can't, we're already living in Vail, I'm working for another firm when, when they came to me and pursued me with the desire to work in our office. And, uh, that's definitely been the greatest trait that I've had with, among my staff is in, in longevity is people who just, they want to be in Vail. They've been there a while and they appreciate it and understand where they are. Got it. So, so when you've had other uh, team members come from other parts of the country, how have you, you know, has that been the arrangement is that they move from wherever they are, they are and then they relocate to Vail and then, and have you, have you yeah. been involved in that process of relocation or? I, I have, and, and uh, I, I can't think of anybody still with me <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um, you know, I've had people who I've, you know, given stipends to and, you know, f- bought them plane tickets and whatnot, hadn't come. And, and I think once they really understood what they were getting into uh, mm-hmm. living in our locale, they, you know, either they either, when they did join on, it didn't last very long or it was, uh, something that said, Oh my God, this is not what I want. And especially again, the younger people realize it's not a, a great place to be unless they really already have a community there. Mm. And, and so now when you're looking to grow the team, well, I suppose, I suppose keeping the team small kind of helps mitigate from having to do lots of hiring as well. Um, and then the business, no, absolutely. And then the business yeah, I, model as well, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're focusing on that, on that demographic as well, which means that you can deliver quite extraordinary things with a small team. Well, I think that, you know, absolutely the, that we've tried to, by keeping it small and keeping our team and I'm, I'm, I'm really focused on keeping my team happy. Yeah. Um, I really, you know, I, I pay well, I, you know, I bonus them when they work really hard. Um, and I really try to make sure that there are, you know, if, if the firm's doing well, we're all doing well is my model. And that has been very fruitful for all of us uh, because everybody's happy. And, and that is perceived with the, with the clients too, when, when they understand that they can trust in that, you know, these, these folks have longevity in my office too. So there's a tremendous appreciation for that with my clientele when I say, yeah, this person has been with me 20 years. Mm. And um, so it, the model, the model works well. Um, from my, you know, from my perception. 
Have you thought much about the the future and the kind of you know, the, the next generation of the of the practice? That might be a little way away away now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, I, I think about it all the time. Uh, you know, I, I've talked to my team about it, and you know, I don't have any heir apparents in the office. Um, I think uh, you know just treating them well, you know, so I've noticed in, in my world that a lot of the firms just don't continue. They, they mm-hmm. kind of die with the principal. Um, and, you know, I hate to right now say that that may be my fate, but that may be my fate that, uh, my firm may not go on without me. Um, mm-hmm. and that's okay. Um, that certainly seems to be um, among the smaller firms, uh, how it works. Uh, definitely see, you know, some of the larger firms that have diversified, you know, from residential that they they go on and form partnerships. I just, again, at our size, have not found that yet. Mm. Uh, you, you, you were saying earlier about, you know, it's really important to keep the, your team happy. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the things that you found make your team happy and what sorts of things <laughs> don't make them happy? Um. You know, we live in a place where people like to play. Um, so I, my office is not structured around everybody being in the office from nine to five. Mm-hmm. Uh, if people want to go on vacation, you know, we, we work around that as a team. Um, being 300 yards from a, a gondola in a ski resort, uh, everybody gets a ski pass if they want one. That's <laughs> part of the, that's part of our benefits package. Um, and, you know, if you want to go skiing for an hour or two during the day and work late or whatever, that's, that's all completely normal in our world. Mm. And I found our clientele also expects that too, uh, that, uh, you know, we, we all play and enjoy where we live and, and the experience that we have. So that's one of the, you know, the, the great things about living in Vail. We really have the outdoors surrounding us. Amazing. Amazing. Um, and in, 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 in terms of, what's next for the for the business or how you're kind of uh you know well, well actually first of all how have you dealt with covid how has how's the pandemic affected you was this has this been another recession that's, or kind of event that's washed you over you've been nicely protected we, we we've been very lucky um you know when when things shut down uh we you know, we had Zoom coffee every morning. I'm not sure we had had a Zoom account before that. Mm-hmm. Um, but every morning we'd all get on the phone and talk and chat as a team and then get on with our days. Um, in all honesty, in April of last year, I thought I was going to be laying off half my team by the end of the summer. And I, I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, we... Uh, we found that, you know, as time went on, our clients were calling and saying, Hey, I need a gym. I need an office. Um, you know, I need this amazing outdoor living space that I can have and, you know, entertain people in. And so, you know, it started out with a lot of remodels and then, uh, other clients got excited, and, you know, clients who had smaller homes or condos and said, you know, I'm going to buy a lot or whatnot. And, you know, so we, it, the, the year has been explosive for us in our, our real estate community. It's just, it's been staggering uh, pretty much in all the resorts around the, the world, I, from what I understand. And um, so it's, it's been amazing this year. It really has. And so, you know, it was a blip on the radar. Really. We, we didn't have any slowdown. We got going, we, you know, muddled our way through the start of this and uh, started moving forward and never looked back. Um, you mentioned there about the real estate community. Um, in in that community, who are some? Have you found the most sort of powerful alliances that you have in terms of different industries and disciplines? Oh, well, we definitely. You know, as time has gone on, we we've aligned with a group of contractors that you know we're we're all in sync with each other and how each other operates. Um, and the comp complexity of the real estate market and, and uh, zoning in our community, when people buy a piece of land, they, you know, they have no idea what they've got and what they can do with it. Right. So we, we find that we're integral in, in the purchases of real estate and that, which often leads to work for us. Um, 
So we're always studying, you know, a realtor will put something on the market and ask us to, you know, give opinions or write letters or whatnot. And that goes in the file that, so when people buy a piece of real estate, they, you know, they already have our name, you know, that we understand the property. So that, that's very typical where we are. And then I think the other attribute is that um, uh, people don't keep things for very long where we are. Um, I, I would say there's a life cycle in a resort community of about 10 years max. Most right. people turn their real estate and move on to the next thing. And um, so what happens is, you know, houses that we did 20 years ago are, you know, on to their second owner and we're remodeling them again. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's always that. That's interesting. Source of growth for us too. Um, you know, houses, there's, there's houses we've remodeled three times that we've designed, which is you know, very abnormal in the real world. <laughs> yeah. That, that's really, that's really interesting and quite, um, an interesting feature of a kind of, I guess a kind of micro economy, if you like, mm-hmm. or a, a micro climate out there where mm-hmm. the, where the real estate is kind of going through its cycles. Um, you mentioned there that you were involved with the real the realtors, so the very front end of the process. Is that um, a service that you, you know, that you that you you get paid for to offer advice on what's possible, or is it something that the clients get involved in, or is it more to do with the people who are actually selling the land and you're giving basic ideas or recommendations or? It, you know, it, it, it varies. Um, often the seller will, you know, through the realtor will ask us to analyze their property so they can, you know, when they put their listing out that they can say, you know, it's got X, Y, and Z rights, and you can add a thousand square feet, whatever. Um, and then often buyers will, you know, on the other side will hire us and say, what do you think about this property? Right. And I'll meet with them and, and, you know, see if we can make their vision and, be accommodated on that property. So it, you know, for the most part, um, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily seek payment on all of those. Mm -hmm. If it's an initial consultation, sure, that's fine. But sometimes people ask us to do some serious work for them before they close. And, you know, we will, we'll always get paid for that work. Um, you know, I just always believe that, you know, our, we have a value to our time and, clients who respect that, that also helps me get to know them too yeah. and understand them to see if we are going to have a viable relationship also. Have you ever taken it uh, a step further and you've kind of started broaching into the world of real estate where you're saying, well, actually, I don't think this site is quite right for what you're looking for. And then you're able to, you know, show them other plots of real estate that might be more appropriate. Is no it question. <laughs> No question. I, I have probably sold more real estate than a lot of realtors <laughs> have sold. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I always joke I should get my license, but, uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those things I help people understand you, where we are. A square foot is a commodity. You, you right. only get so much and zoning is so complex that, you know, if people have a vision, I'm like, well, wait, I, I just saw this other one. And, you know, I'll, I'll go, I'm always seeing what's, you know, the more unique properties around. So the, yes, absolutely. I'm, I, I've sold a lot of real estate. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And, and do you, do you then actively, are you kind of you know, driving around the area and looking for plots or you're, you're actively in a conversation with realtors about what sites they have available to, to be able to do that or. Yeah. You know, just like contractors, there's a whole series of realtors that I'm pretty well aligned with and, yeah. and, you know, if they get a new listing or, you know, they have a client looking, you know, they call me, you know, what have you seen? Or can you look at this? So it's, you know, fortunately we're not a big urban area. So, you know, I actually pretty much know our whole community of where real estate is. And um, so when somebody says, have you seen this? I'm like, yeah, I got, you know, I can sometimes often fire off a, an analysis of the property, you know, that I did, you know, even, even sometimes years ago, uh, it's crazy, but, uh, you know, that's the, the, with so limited quality properties, you know, I, I, I'm blessed to get to see those quality properties always, mm. you know, so. It's, it's really interesting because it, what's fascinating is that you've got a real, like it's a real niche because the area, right. And, mm-hmm. and you're, you're kind of, um, 
you've developed a very deep knowledge of that of that locale, which would be very difficult from for another architect uh, to be able to design there. Does that often happen that you have other, you know, clients will come in and they've brought architects from different parts of the US or even different countries um, mm-hmm. trying to do work in that area and they get they get unstuck and they not, they might need to consult with yourselves? Um, it does happen a lot. Um, you know, right now we're working with a Mexican architect on a project. We have a awesome project that is on hold right now that we've been doing with Kengo Kuma in Tokyo. Oh, right. Fantastic. Um, and uh, I'm hoping we're, we're all crossing our fingers that we're going to break ground about a year from now on that one. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, we, we have done some, you know, just really had some great alliances with architects from other places. And, and I also find when I work elsewhere, I do the same thing. I have no qualms about, you know, seeing mm-hmm. if I can find somebody to be a teammate with me on the process and that, and that works well. So it's always good to have great collaboration with, with others. What, what are some of the, what makes a good collaboration from your perspective? Um, you know, the, the, the project with King Okuma's office uh, has been a great collaboration. Uh, I, you know, I was a little unsure about what I was getting into when, when uh, I started the project, it was somebody we designed a house for had not built. And uh, they called me one day and said, I'm not going to use you as my architect, but I want to, I need you to be my architect on this project. And he told me who he was talking to. And I was, Oh, you know, absolutely. I'm in, let's do it. <laughs> uh, got, to, got a couple of trips to Japan out of it too, but, um, but they, they've definitely been one that it's been a unique process because we, we, it's never, you know, we're going to go design and hand it to you. It's been, you know, we, we would sit and have design sessions and, and, really it was a team effort, very collaborative. Mm. We were just all together, you know, regardless of name of the firm, it didn't mean anything. We were all on the same team designing the same house. And, um, I really appreciated that and admire that and, and and forged some long-term relationships with that office because of that. So it's been great. Amazing. And did you, so you, you actually went out there to Kengo Kuma's office and kind of saw their working practices and understood a little bit about how they, their culture and, and how did you determine whose role was what? Well, you know, they, they often, or they function much like my office does where they're, you know, each project has a team on it. And right. I actually had a team of Americans uh, in, in Tokyo who were on my project so they, you know, they would never hesitate to hop on a plane, fly to the U.S. for 36 hours or what for for a work session. But uh, you know, I, I went over there multiple times for meetings with them and the client, and presentations with with King Okuma himself to the client. And uh, you know, unique. Uh, their offices, uh, you know, they're all spread out, but. Uh, you know, I I joked to when I got back to my my firm that just imagine our space with. 50 people in it. Um, that's, you know, very different culture in Tokyo from what I have mm-hmm. in, in Bell, Colorado, but very, you know, very energizing and fun to work with this team. Um, just amazing, amazing process. Fantastic. And, and, and finally, how do you instill kind of a design culture and a business culture within your team? Um, and that, that might be a, a broader question about, you know, what are, what are your company values and how do you communicate them? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really been part of the culture of our community where, you know, everybody is allowed to have their own life. And, you know, if somebody has an issue or a challenge, there's no hesitation, go, you know, mm-hmm. if you've got to go pick up your kid, go, you know, um, your family's coming to town, whatever. So we've, we've always um, maybe not been, you know, we don't socialize as much together as a team. I've tried that and that has not been, you know, we'll go skiing or, you know, (laughs) go have lunch or something like that. But our firm does not really gather, but we all help each other. So if somebody is uh, going on vacation or um, we, we all jump in and help each other and work as a team on a project, you know, to, to, to cover the bases and make sure that the flow continues. Um, so it's really, you know, everybody's, you know, we have no fighting in our office. We have, everybody's really together, you know, 
just I've been very lucky to build a culture. And again, I, I have very little turnover um, and tremendous longevity among my team. So it, I, I don't know what I'm doing right, but it's working and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep going with it. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think that's the the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation there. And I just want to say a massive thank you, Carl, for sharing your experience and your insights into, uh, into your practice. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure too. Thank you. Brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.